This session brought to you by Odyssey Games for pre-orders and sealed product, CCG Prime for tons of singles and supplies, Cardo Doco for international rulers looking for products, and FoulLibrary.com for articles and wonderful deck lists. As well as our guest lecturer members, King Pearlshine, Vite Ramen, Mog Knight, and Darren Noblock. Class is in session. Hey there guys, welcome back. My name is Paul and today we're going to be taking a look at the first video in a series of videos that we hope to do here on Ruler School TCG that are going to introduce you to different parts of the Force of Will game. And today we're going to start with deck building. So this is Deck Building 101 presented by yours truly, Paul Raisman. I'm a teaching assistant here at Ruler School TCG if you've never watched our channel. Uh, but you are in Force of Will, this is the one-stop shop for you. So you're definitely going to want to tune in and hit that subscribe button and ring that bell because we have feature matches and a whole bunch of other stuff that I'm going to be talking about a little bit later here in the video. But this is definitely Force of Will Central. This is the place you want to go if you're not going anywhere else uh, because we just have everything you could possibly want for Force of Will. So this is Deck Building 101. We're going to be learning how to deck build today, at least how we deck build here at the channel. So let's set the table a little bit before we get a little bit farther into this video. So this is a guide designed to teach you how to build better Force of Will decks for your locals, uh, maybe a Grand Prix or even Force of Will Festival, uh, or if there are other competitive environments you're a part of. This is going to be a really helpful guide for you to improve your deck building and hopefully do well in those events. Now, this guide comes from the experience of the Ruler School staff, and these are suggestions in deck building for everyone. If you end up building decks differently because of a different way you've built decks in the past, or uh, you just have a different philosophy altogether, that's great. We still hope you enjoyed the video, and we hope that you pick something up that you might want to include into that. If this is not including something that you wish uh, we would include, let us know down in the comment section down below. You're not only helping us, but you're helping other people who are watching the video and perhaps uh, uh, just need uh, some other advice that might be really useful for deck building. But again, these uh, ideas are expressed in this guide as part of our experience here at Ruler School. We've been playing you know, trading card games for about 20 years collectively here. Um, which would be, I guess, 40 years collectively here, if I do my math correctly. Um, so we have a lot of experience in playing card games uh, of a variety. And so this is kind of what has been uh, the culmination of that. So the ideas presented in this video are also uh, not exclusive to the Wanderer format, although that is going to be our primary focus when we talk about deck building today. We are uh, primarily focused on that format, but this can go into formats like ABC or Pauper. If you're still playing New Frontiers, this is also really helpful for New Frontiers and becomes a lot easier even in New Frontiers because of the limited card pool. So this is a really good way for you to just learn how to build decks in this game uh, all together and might even come in handy if you're building for other card games. So also before we get started, I want you all to know about some tools that are going to be really helpful for your deck building. Forceofwill.online is the place where I go to make all of my decks. It's not only a deck builder, it's a card database that allows you to add any card that's in the game's history uh, into that deck builder and uh, allows you to just con construct decks for uh, infinitum. There, there are so many different uh, decks that I have built right now. Uh, they also have a good place for collecting all of the spoilers that come out during spoiler season like right now. Uh, Judgment of the Rogue Planet definitely has some spoilers that have been collected onto forceofwind.online and they even have a helpful little spoilers tab for you if you're looking for those specifically. Also when you get done building decks, uh, they have deck statistics for you including the, the color combinations that you're using and the curve that you have for your deck. So it's it's really the, the only place to build uh, Force of Will decks as far as I'm concerned so you definitely want to check that out. Next up we have uh, the best Force of Will simulator that we have right now in untapped.in. This is a pretty open client. It's web-based, so you don't need to download any software or anything, but it does uh, give you access to playing Force of Will through the power of the internet. If you're not a webcam player or uh, if you're just not able to play in person for some reason, Force of Will uh, is simulated on untapped.in. Uh, you do have to learn how to use the client in order to, you know, tap cards and call stones and stuff like that. It's not automatic, but it is still really useful for if you want an online game. 
We also have FoulLibrary.com, which is a database of tournament winning decks for net decking purposes. It's also got really helpful articles if you're looking into different uh, deck profile reviews or someone's tournament report from their experience at a GP, uh, or even if you're trying to start your own card game business, uh, FoulLibrary.com has a lot of really good articles outside of um, deck building purposes and stuff like that. But if you're looking for decks specifically, this is a really good place for uh, cards um, that have been put into decks ever since the game his ever since the game's history. Dennis has done a really really good job of trying to go back even as far back as Grim Cluster for those decks. So that's really great. And of course, I can't help but mention us here at Ruler School. Um, we are the largest YouTube channel for Force of Will content here currently, and so uh, we are definitely trying to pump out all these different kinds of content to teach people how to play the game and to spread awareness of the game. We have feature matches, deck profiles, different guides like this one, uh, how to's, uh, spoilers in, in our YouTube shorts as well. And then we also have a podcast every Monday so we can talk about all the different kinds of force of will news and our opinions. If that's something that you're really interested in, I would suggest hitting that subscribe button and ringing that bell so that you don't miss content like this as we go through. So when I was thinking about how to start this guide, I wanted to start with the theory for deck building. And that's where we have um, uh, the deck building uh, square, if you want to think about it this way. Uh, maybe some of you have seen this as a triangle that focuses on consistency, power, and repeatability. However, I added in something else, so I, have, I modified the theory to some degree to include something that's really important in Force of Will, and that is flexibility. So consistency is uh, about the ease by which your deck executes its key plays. Uh, sometimes decks have uh, more consistency tools than others, um, but that's a really important element in any deck. The deck has to be powerful, right? It has to bring um, some sort of strength to the environment that it is in. Otherwise, it will just not do anything and it won't stop your opponent from doing anything. And it's always relative to the power of other decks in the format. Um, so there are older decks that you know don't have quite as much power because they haven't received as much of a focus from the company. That's just sort of the natural cycle of trading card games. But the decks that are powerful, that do have something to offer, are usually the ones that float into the metagame. And so we also have repeatability, the ability to repeat, uh, to repeat plays that are netting you advantage or that stifle your opponent and keep them off of their game plan. Repeatability is really important for the, for the sake of maintaining pressure, right? But then flexibility comes in, uh, which is the ability to pivot around obstacles that stop your strategy from happening. And there are definitely some decks that do this a little bit more gracefully than others. And so it's important to keep flexibility in mind when you think about this stuff. So again, this is the sort of the, 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 the situation that we have here. If your deck is consistent and flexible, but it doesn't have any power, it may not do very well in the metagame environment. Um, if your deck is powerful and it can repeat things, but it doesn't have flexibility, right? It's just, it's just very, um, very singular in the way that it, it executes its plants. It it's going to have some, some issues <laughs> going in to a competitive environment or even being able to do its aggressive things, right? So you have to consider, uh, what is going on here, um, in your deck as you think about these different elements, right? The other thing you need to know about decks is that uh, there's a variety of different archetypes in these games. And I'm using this a little bit differently than you might hear other people who play TCGs talk about. I'm talking about archetypes in terms of uh, large deck archetypes like aggro or mid-range or control um, that sort of encapsulate a strategy that a deck is trying to do. So in, in, in the spirit of archetyping, <laughs> right, Aggro decks are decks that win games quickly through aggressive plays. Mid-range decks are decks that are slower than aggro decks but faster than control decks, and they tend to combine elements of both to try and create a flexible gameplay um, and a variety of options for you as you play through things, right? So mid-range can skew a little bit more aggressively. It can skew also a little bit more in the control direction. It really just depends on the cards that you're putting in the deck at that point. Um, but mid-range is probably the most flexible kind 
of uh, deck archetype you can use. Then you have control decks, which are um, Force of Will's bre uh, bread and butter. For control is just such a powerful kind of deck in Force of Will. It kind of has to be said, right? So these are decks. So these are decks that outlast other decks through disruption and advantage. Um, so basically, over time, I'm going to kill you with uh, one one additional card at a time, one stifle at a time, until uh, I just take all of your momentum and all the wind in your sails is gone. We also have decks that like to combo or win through executing a primary combination of cards consistently, right? Combo decks, uh, you know, we've had them in the game before, um, and we do have a handful of them in the game still, but for the most part, combo decks have been sort of weeded out of Force of Will. There are not very many out there, but they do exist, and you, need to, you do need to recognize that they do exist, but they're, they're pretty penned in at this point so that they don't run amok. We also have tempo decks, which are also relatively rare in Force of Will, but they do exist. These are decks that attempt to win through maximizing momentum in a game. This focuses on cards that benefit from being played while also taking away an opponent's advantage, right? So if you play a card that says your opponent has to put a stone in their stone area back on top of their deck, this might be a tempo card because it says that I'm going to gain momentum while you lose it. And that's really important to recognize as well. Tempo is uh, something in Force of Will that's pretty easily established because of the low curve that we have. But it's still a kind of deck that exists in this game, so you need to keep that in mind. So with all of this in your head, let's start building your deck. This is where uh, we start fashioning everything together. This is where we start pulling together the theory, right? We need decks that can have at least three or even four legs underneath it as a chair. And we also need to be able to say what kind of deck it is and help it execute its main strategy. So here's some basic understanding that you need to have a Force of Will decks. So Force of Will games have been adjusted over time to take as little as three turns to win a game. So you have about three turns to establish your game plan and get things underway. Um, in terms of aggro and burn decks, they are probably going to be the decks that win the game within three turns most consistently. There's very few times now in, in Force of Will where you win on game two or before. In fact, I don't know any deck that wins on turn one at this point. Uh, the, the company has used the ban list and they use their card design to really adjust the state of the game back down to uh, three turns is the earliest you can lose the game. The curve in Force of Will is also much shorter than it is in other mana-based games. I would say 90% of the cards that are used in the metagame are between 1 and 3 will. I say 90% because there's always a few cards that sneak through. Um, and they do some really interesting things like uh, Electra Shooting Star of Fire is one of those cards that would probably go outside of that 90%. But for the most part, you're looking at really cheap removal. Um, you're looking at two and three drops that do something uh, as they are put into the field and uh, actually establish some sort of tempo or advantage in your favor. Uh, skill and gameplay, though, is probably the most important factor when you are looking into your deck building. If, if a deck is going to succeed, you need to pilot it well and you need to understand the game. And so as we go into the future here with these video series, we're going to be taking a look at how to maximize your skill as a player as well. Um, and this probably goes forth much farther, if not, if not just as much as deck construction can go. The distance between tier one and tier two decks is not as pronounced as it is in other games is what I'm essentially trying to say here. You can be playing a tier two deck and if you pilot it well and you have decent matchups, there's a real chance you can get into the top eight of a GP or even for something like Foul Fest, right? Uh, it really comes down to your skill as a player as much as it is deck construction. So these are some questions you need to ask yourself when you are deck building. How do I win the game? Or alternatively, how do I end the game? Uh, there are certain play, uh, certain places you can do to make that all happen. However, this is the main question you need to be asking in our opinion, right? If you're just playing cards and you're putting things onto the field and you don't know how to win the game, 
that's great, but I don't know what your deck is going to do if you can't win, right? So you need to figure out how you're going to win the game. How are you going to close this out? What is your win condition? How does your opponent stop you from executing your plays, right? The metagame is diverse, but often comes down to a handful of strategies or, to, or more than that, usually in Force of Will's case. So how does your opponent stop you in an environment where... Things like Fair Spell exist, or even uh, Number 13, Anti-Magic exist. Uh, what do you do if your opponent is able to generate more advantage than you, and therefore your plan kind of stalls in comparison to theirs? These are all things that you need to consider as well. How do you stop your opponent from winning, right? This is a question about how do you disrupt their game plan while also playing to your strengths. That's an important question that you might want to ask as well. And what common cards or strategies are being used in the metagame that shape your deck building choices? This is probably uh, the, bigger, the bigger question as to how you are going to be constructing your deck with the ruler of your choice. Speaking of which, you can start with a ruler or you can have a core group of cards that you want to play because they have synergy together. This is one of two different paths you can take. They all kind of lead into a, a, a sort of like a middle stage where you are pairing that group of cards with a ruler to make the most of those cards. Um, but in general, this is the two different directions that you can come at deck building when it comes down to Force of Will. You can start with a ruler of your choice. Uh, sometimes folks will choose to pick something like uh, the new Electra Ruler, which is almost always focused on high armaments and curving out really early so your opponent is a little bit set back in terms of what they can do. Or if there's just a combination of cards, which like we'll talk about here in just a second, um, that have really good synergy together and that's part of your main plan, that's how you start uh, with your deck building construction. What are your optimal play line, right? So when you, when you look at the ways in which you can play your cards together and when you look at your mulligan and what you are trying to accomplish you have to think about how does my opponent stop me at point one at point two and at point three right so if on turn one i'm trying to play one card which helps me go into something on turn two uh can my opponent get rid of that easily that's a real question you need to consider as well remember that force of will has a very low curve compared to most other mana based card games right with magic the gathering you could go to turn seven even nine um as you consider you know kind of what is your game plan force of will is a lot shorter so in that way um kind of think of what your core plays are going to be it's probably uh, really important for you to think about as you consider how is my opponent going to stop me or disrupt me? And then it's really important to take uh, take your deck and throw it against other decks, right? <laughs> um, throw your decks uh, against uh, opponents either on untap or in person, and then just take notes, right? If you have thoughts during the game, uh, discuss it with your opponent, right? If you have a playtest partner, this is a really good opportunity for you to say, is this card choice working or is this not contributing in a way? So I wanted to give you all an example, and I'm going to do it in a very Paul Reisman way, and talk about um, a core group of cards that have synergy together, um, that have a relatively easy play line to establish early in the game that I've been using for a while now, and that is the combination of Dolly and Ray Asnable. So both have Barrier, which is something I'm really interested in, right? Um, but Dolly is a one cost that can be pulled out of the deck from uh, his specified ruler, right? So I could have started this with Olivia or I could have started this with Dolly uh, and Ray Asenable. And I, and I said, okay, Dolly has this ability to produce blue will. That's really valuable in the game. I kind of just know that from playing the game. Playing, uh, playing cards that give you additional will is pretty uncommon now, right? It's a design decision that the company has had where they said, we're not gonna make a lot of these cards, but when we do, um, they're gonna be something you wanna look at. So Dolly produces blue will. It also returns uh, anything that's not a G ruler or a magic stone back to the hand, uh, including my own stuff. So he's very flexible for that. You can also just draw me a card, right? So playing a card that draws me another card, um, maintaining hand advantage, putting something that's hard to remove uh, from the game it's a 4-4. Four, four. I mean, there's just a lot of good stuff happening here, right? And then Ray Asnable um, says that I can reduce the cost of his total cost by one void 
any time an entity I control was put back into my hand. And because Dolly doesn't specify sort of uh, what card you bounce, you can bounce itself. And Ray Asimov can come out as soon as turn one if you have a coin, which is really helpful, right? Uh, Ray Asimov is also really helpful in hand as something that can uh, cancel enter abilities, which is really helpful. Um, but if you get him onto the field, he's a 9-9 with barrier that says your opponent's stuff doesn't enter <laughs> and have enter abilities, right? Outside of their stones and their J rulers, right? Uh, I'm sorry, J resonators will also not trigger, excuse me. So J resonators, additions, and regalia will not trigger um, if they're put into the field under Ray Asnable's control. So this to me seems like a really strong two card combination that has a lot of staying power because of that barrier keyword. There's definitely some stats there. You know, they're pretty standard stats for the cost of the resonators that are here. Um, but Ray Asnable does hit a lot of stuff in the metagame currently. Um, it stops some really powerful inner effects that the game does indeed focus more on than not. And so let's look at the natural progression here, right? So Dolly and Ray Asnable work together. Dolly is really, uh, really Olivia's card, right? She can use her God's Art to fetch Dolly from the deck. That's really important. And so my head then goes to what is the primary support that Olivia has that's really interesting. And if you look into her, um, her uh, deck specific support, you start to see things like Surging Lightning, right? And if you read that card very closely, it's a one mana quick cast card that says destroy something at random. Um, that's really helpful because it gets around things like Barrier. So if my opponent's trying to play uh, control against me, I now have this one mana answer to their Barrier Resonators uh, because this technically gets around it, it doesn't target. So that's really, really helpful to have. Um, it also gets rid of anything on the field outside of a Magic Stone. Um, so it can pop J Rulers, it can pop Resonators, it can pop anything with Barrier, of course. It can pop Regalia and Additions. This is really helpful. Uh, and barrier is a really important keyword in this game. So the fact that I can get around that is, you know, piquing my interest a little bit here. We also have cards like Thunder Empress's Strike, which allow me to basically turn that card into any two drop wa water resonator, or any two drop uh, water chant, uh, even cards that don't have quick cast. This card can make them uh, accessible because it indeed has quick cast. It also allows me to deal some damage, allows me to bounce the board draw some cards um that's also just like really strong utility for a card like this and we're getting more and more two drops uh for blue in this game as time goes on so this card is going to just appreciate in value um as we go ahead there are other cards that are accessible um in her support as well things like fish of the demonic world um dealing 10 damage is still really significant in this game so the fact that you can do it to three different targets is pretty powerful still and then i just look at regular blue support what stuff in blue is really intriguing and what stuff can uh olivia make use of right uh cards like fiola right fiola can come in and enter and tuck something that isn't a resonator onto the bottom of the deck. Instead of uh, having a traditional cancel, I have something that typically gets around cancels. So cards like Electro, Shooting Star of Fire, they can't be uh, canceled. Um, there, That is a whole group of cards um, that exist in this game. And sometimes when cards can't be canceled, they can still be interacted with. And Fiola is a way to do that. We also have cards like Loki's Instinct, so if your opponent is playing a lot of quick cast cards uh, and then you need to get rid of those, uh, you can Loki's Insight on turn one uh, by using Olivia's God's Art to bring out Dolly to produce blue and then using your coin or even your first stone to just say you have two less cards in your hand. Like that is a really powerful play and can really stifle opponents um, and put the tempo into your favor. So if we had to go back to our um, deck building theory uh, square here, our chair, um, you can see here that there's a lot of flexibility, there's a lot of consistency with Olivia, but it can sometimes have some issues with repeatability and can sometimes have issues with power. So now we have to start to fill in uh, those issues, right? So the main plan here again is to uh, play Dolly, to go into Grey Asnable, and then the question I have is, I win when I do what? 
right? And in the meantime, while I'm trying to establish that game plan, I have cards like Surging Lightning, Fiola, and Thunder Empress's Strike to disrupt my opponent, to advance my board state, uh, to make things really uncomfortable for my opponent. Um, and that's a really good place to be at this point. So the question is then, how do I win? How do I increase the power of my deck? How do I increase the repeatability of it? Those are the main questions, right? So let's take a look at what we've got established at this point in the game plan, right? So I know that barrier is gonna make these cards really hard to remove from the field. The stats are decent, but they're not remarkable. So that's a, that's a little bit of a strike against it. It lends themselves to controlling the game state and it stifles opponent's tempo and momentum, right? This is a control strategy, right? So consistency can be a little bit of an issue. If you don't see Ray Asnable in your hand, that could be an issue, but you always have consistent access to cards like Dolly because of the God's Heart. So I would actually change this a little bit. I'd say uh, a little bit of consistency can go a long way here, um, but the flexibility in the game plan here with all of these different options on my cards makes me feel really comfortable. Um, I am also really able to, um, if I play four Ray Asnable, I can kind of get into the into the, the strength of the repeatability here. And I also have some powerful cards, Thunder Empress's Strike, to help me repeat certain plays over and over again. So the deck's gonna be relatively slow. It's gonna take incremental advantage over time. Um, and it doesn't really close out games neatly. So when we need a good win condition for a control deck, it specializes in disrupting, setting back the opponent, and it's really difficult to interact with because of cards um, with the barrier keyword. So we know all of this, right? We have this game plan. This is what we're gonna try and do. So the questions I have at this point are, what's my win condition? How do I stop and disrupt my opponent? Um, how do I win, right? I win by playing this strategy or this card, right? How does my opponent stop me, right? Um, how do I stop my opponent from winning the game, right? Um, how do I stop and disrupt my opponent from doing what they want to do while also going ahead here, right? I'm already thinking that way in terms of how Ray Asnable works, but are there other ways that I can disrupt my opponent and keep them off of winning the game as well? And then what are common cards and strategies being used in the metagame right now, right? I'm also making that call with Ray Asnable, noticing that, uh, in, at least in Force of Will in general, there's just a lot of enter, uh, enter the field effects, right? So anytime stuff comes into the field, um, it's going to produce some sort of advantage for the opponent. And enter the enter the game effects are probably like 70 to 80% of the game in Force of Will. So uh, knowing that, I play Ray Asnable. What about the other 20% of cards that are being played, right? Um, Ainz, for example, uh, can just adopt the effects of gears he reveals from outside the game, including things like Great Dimension Library. So how do I stop my opponent from gaining so much advantage that... Um, they just kind of drown me out as a result of that. They just have more resources. All of these are really important questions and we're just kind of putting the theory to uh, the practice at this point. So now we're in the testing stage, right? I'm starting to bring cards together. I'm starting to realize like, okay, maybe four Dolly, maybe three to four Ray Asnable, definitely four Surging Lightning, three to four Thunder Empress's Strike. Uh, maybe even three to four Fiola, and I'm starting to fill out the deck, and eventually I'm going to have um, my first draft of that deck, right? So in the testing stage, the questions that I'm asking myself and what I'm searching for is, how easily am I able to actually disrupt my opponent? Uh, is the strategy in my head actually working, in other words, right? When I put these cards together and I, and I execute my game plan, does it do what I think it's supposed to do? Is my strategy easy to disrupt? Is my opponent able to keep me off of Ray Asnable getting onto the field and then following up into a win condition outside of that? Um, that's a really important question to ask yourself as well. What cards or strategies seem to give me the most trouble and how do I adjust my deck to accommodate for those, right? One of the things that we need to recognize is uh, Olivia ha has one God's Art. So if that God's Art doesn't go off and I have Ray Asnable in my hand, I'm set back a few turns, right? So how do I prevent my um, my ray from being uh, disrupted and not put onto the field as early as possible, right? 
how comfortable are you piling the deck as it is? I mean, sometimes when you pick up decks that are new to you, you're not gonna play them super well because you don't understand the interactions quite yet. But that's why testing is super important. Is the deck feeling comfortable the way that you pilot it? Is it, uh, does it, is it complementing your play style, in other words? That's important to recognize as well. Are there cards in the deck that can be played at lesser numbers? Are there cards that you need to see play in the deck? Um, this kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier, right? This is kind of connected to, is your strategy easy to disrupt? And um, if there are cards that are giving you trouble, maybe you want to include cards in your deck that help you to, to manage those things, right? Also, you might want to consider what cards in games two and three would be helpful against particular strategies, right? This is getting toward building the side deck, uh, but that's a whole nother video that I want to talk about as well. It's going to be a little bit of an addendum to this video, um, but I do want to talk about how do you think about game two and game three? How do you consider the coin and how it factors into um, extra will? The coin has become very important as an additional will source as the game has gone on, so you definitely want to consider those things. Um, are there things you can bring in from your sideboard to either make sure that you have have the edge secured or are there cards that'll help you sort of fight back against your opponent in a way so you're not really on the back foot anymore that's important to be thinking about as you are going into the testing stage then you go into the editing stage right and this is kind of something you're going to be doing a lot right so against the metagame when did my deck succeed or struggle and why did it struggle when it did right why did it succeed when it did what was it able to do this is something you need to recognize as these are the cards that are doing the most work in the deck, right? You also need to consider if the deck needs to improve or if you just need to play the deck better. Oftentimes, a lot of players um, don't recognize that maybe the deck doesn't need to change. Maybe you need more practice or maybe you need to learn more core fundamentals in Forts of Will in order for you to get the most out of the deck that you're playing. Sometimes it is the pilot and sometimes it is the deck, but you need to know the difference, right? Uh, it can be both at times too, um, but being able to distinguish which is which is really going to be really important. So what notes did you take that you might help you understand how to adjust your deck or your play style going into the future, right? If your opponent is able to consistently disrupt you, you need to understand what is doing that. Is it the way they're playing the cards or sequencing them? Is it particular cards that you didn't account for in deck building? These are going to be really helpful questions, right? Also, you need to consider why am I playing this deck and strategy? Uh, as opposed to a different one, right? Why am I playing Olivia, <laughs> right? Why am I playing this this deck? Admittedly, a lot of people are probably always asking, why is Paul so obsessed with Olivia? And at the end of the day, it comes down to, I think that deck, while it can struggle sometimes with power um, and consistency, uh, it's also a deck that has a lot of flexibility and I really enjoy that play style. There's a lot of tools that Olivia has um, and I like the flexibility and the utility of her cards. And that's what makes me feel really interested in playing her as a deck. Are there other kinds of decks maybe then that are a little bit more consistent, have a little bit more power in today's metagame? Who knows? This is part of the process as we go through and we think about the different decks that we could be playing. So at the end of the day, this is kind of what deck building is. You conceptualize, you test, you edit, you rinse, recycle, repeat, right? This is the whole strategy in a nutshell. You conceptualize, you test, you edit. You conceptualize, test, and edit. <laughs> and this is what you do in the game of Force of Will. And you do this fairly regularly because Maybe there are things you didn't account for, but there's always new cards as well. So that's what makes this circle so fun uh, to run in, right? So before we leave you today, the one thing I wanted to talk about today is skill. How do I know when I'm getting better at force of will? Because I think sometimes we don't talk enough about this as a concept, right? How do you know when you're improving at, uh, at, at card games in general, right? How do you know that you're getting better? So when I asked this to Jeremy, he thought about it for a minute um, 
and came back relatively quickly, right, with these answers because uh, Jeremy and I are both really invested in figuring out how do we increase our skill at the game, how do we master the game, and how do we do um, do better in particular matchups when we're pat when we're practicing, right? If you're able to read your opponent and you're able to understand what their deck does and disrupt those plans with your own plans you're probably improving at card games. Like once you start to see that um, sort of uh, decision-making that you can make to disrupt your opponent and keep your opponent off of their plan, that's how you know you're improving. When you know you're improving, when you're able to make accurate reads about the cards that your opponent has in their hand without seeing them yourself. Believe it or not, your opponents tell you a lot more than you might think. Because even though their hand is a hidden zone and even though... Um, you know, there we don't know the cards that are in their deck definitively. You can make some educated guesses as to what they are doing based on what cards they are playing, uh, what cards they're not playing, and sort of their body language as well. You also uh, are growing at card games when you know what cards are contributing and which cards are taking away from your goal. This is something that you're gonna to need to, to understand in any card game, right? How do I know what card needs to be taken out and how do I know what card needs to be put in? Um, that's important for you to recognize as well. So what cards are contributing and which cards are not? Uh, how is my opponent trying to win the game and how do I disrupt their plans while also establishing my own? How do I know um, uh, what cards they have in their hand based on the cards that they've played already. These are all really key skills to develop your skill uh, as part of the deck building process. But guys, do you have any questions? That's going to be something I'm going to need you to ask us down in the comment section down below. When you do, you're helping us all learn, so please do that. Um, if there are any specifics, if there is something I didn't cover, if there is something that uh, wasn't included in the presentation, the comment section is the place to ask it. You're helping me uh, create better content, but you're also helping the community grow and understand this game a lot better. So let us know down in the comment section down below. If you haven't subscribed yet and you haven't rung that bell, you're going to be missing videos like this one because we're going to be doing a whole lot more of these going into the future. Other than that, guys, uh, my name has been Paul. I'm a teaching assistant here at Ruler School TCG, and it's been a pleasure having you. Until next time, class is dismissed.